So um, I also have the pleasure of introducing our next panel. So we've all heard the age old proverb, if a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? But how often are we considering that in our movement work? Incorporating strong media strategy into our movements should be an essential step in our organizing efforts. And we're excited for this panel representing journalists, producers, and activists to help you and your organization develop strong media strategy and make sure that people hear about the important work that you're doing. Today's panel will be moderated by Jerome McDonald, former host of Worldview with WBEZ. And our panelists today are Hassan El Tayeb, lead lobbyist uh, on Middle East policy at FCNL, and also used to uh, have the position Lizzie has currently, and Chris Giovannis, communication director of the Chicago Teachers Union. I pass it over to Jerome. Hello, thanks, and uh, good on you for doing this conference. I'm so excited about it, and I looked at the, the, the conference agenda, and it just looks awesome. And I'm so glad that you are engaging people at Peace Action with this kind of work, and young people, and coming together, and the, the whole agenda, the scope of the agenda is so exciting to me. So um, I'm glad to be a part of it, and will do my humble best here with the, the media panel to um, have, a, have a little um, back and forth about what media is and how media thinks. And, and I, you know, I think we are coming at this from kind of a conventional media point of view, um, corporate media point of view. I, you know, I was with a public radio station for many years. Um, but um, it's, a, it's an ingredient, I think, of what you're trying to do and tell your story. And I think Margaret was alluding to that. It's, um, it's, a, it's a maybe important component to making the change. Uh, but maybe less so than it used to be. So that's a good thing, I think. And um, you know, with us here is uh, Chris Giovannis, and uh, Chris has uh, worked with um, the um, Chicago Teachers Union, being their communications director. And uh, it's great to have you, Chris. Thanks for joining us. And also with us is Hassan Al Tiab. He's a lead lobbyist on Middle East policy. Uh, with the uh, Friends, uh, uh, the Quaker organization that does lobbying in Washington, D.C., and uh, he's um, been involved over the years uh, with uh, the issue on, on Yemen and uh, the bombing in Yemen, and been very successful in lobbying on that issue. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Hassan, for joining us. And the first question uh, that we're going to tackle here is, about what makes news. What do, what do news organizations think uh, news is when, um, when it comes to uh, an event, a happening, uh, something that's being organized or uh, something you're trying, a movement you're trying to make. Uh, Chris, uh, how do you react to that question? Because um, it gets pretty quickly to the base that, you know, um, the judgment on news is kind of a subjective thing, but there are little criteria that people make and that, that, that cut things off. Um, how do you look at this? Muted, muted, you're muted. Sorry about that. There, I, I find, and I'm speaking right now from the luxury of Working for uh, one of the largest unions in the city, a union that does not have to struggle to get media prominence at all. That was not the case, for example, um, you know, at the beginning of the second Gulf War, when I had a very clear conversation with the assignment editor at the Tribune, who said, when you have more than 17% of support, we'll consider giving you more than 17% of the coverage, even though you've got thousands of people outside of our door right now. Um, one of the things, interestingly, that in influences newsrooms right now is social media. Um, I could probably, in terms of my engagement work with reporters now, take a hike for a few weeks, but as long as we were driving our stories on social media, we'd get traction. I mean, how many articles have we looked at recently where reporters are 
you know, half the story is a recitation of tweets that are out there in the public sphere. And I think this is an extremely important um, dynamic to pay attention to because at the same time, people probably heard, you know, the Tribune just underwent a sale, which is going to eviscerate that newspaper. And while their editorial line has always been reactionary, borderline proto-fascist, and actually at the time of the rise of fascism in Western Europe, openly fascist sometimes. Um, but their newsroom, you know, it adheres to as responsibly as it can, much more on the, you know, lower end of the food chain than the higher end of the food chain, chain which becomes politicized as you go up the hierarchy of a news organization like that, um, those people are trying to practice responsible journalism. Now we can argue that the responsible journalistic rules that have been laid out are inadequate because they assume a level of bipartisanship that is frankly not a quality of the human condition, um, but they do try to at least advocate for the facts. Um, and they're going to be white, even as, you know, we are trying to advance a more fair, um, you know, kind of perspective from reporters nationally and globally on issues like Palestine, which, you know, the mainstream media has gotten wrong for 70 years. I mean, you know, yeah. we... I want to swing over to Hassan, and, and you're talking about telling your own story and making your own story with social media, and and people are going to pick up on it, and it's you know obviously happening with the reduced newsroom sizes. They're looking for kind of ready-built stories. You have a ready-built story. Um, you have a movement. You have something. You know, a social media presence. You're going to blow it up for them. They're going to get hits. You're going to get hits. Everybody's going to be happy. It's a it's a it's a whole new world. Um, Hassan, um, what's news? What's news? Uh, thank you so much, Jerome, Chris. Uh, thank you to Kappa. I, I miss y'all. I, I live in Washington, D.C. now, and I'm trying to make news. Uh, you know, what's the, what's the saying? If you don't like the news, go make your own. Um, I think that's uh, really important. So the way I approach it is what we're trying to do is build coalition support, like really build a broad base of coalition support. So normally I do this through letters. I'm just gonna explain kind of how I generate news and generate media, just because I think there are a lot of activists in the room here that might benefit. So what we try to do is we pull together these coalitions and then we start pitching reporters. You know, Not everybody wants to cover a coalition effort, but that's a way for you to kind of craft your own messaging and then and make sure that you're reaching out to reporters that care about it. Um, you know, most recently there is a situation with uh, Boeing about to sell a bunch of weapons to Israel, $735 million. That's a local story in Chicago because Boeing has, um, Boeing has their headquarters right downtown. And so that's, a, that's an opportunity for you all to like, you know, maybe organize an effort and then try to get some uh, action. And that connects with a national story because AOC and Bernie have just introduced resolutions of disapproval. So, you know, local uh, stories that connect to something national. And when you are organizing the coalition efforts, that can, that can actually make news and you can crack in. Um, you know, most recently I, I was working with Senator Warren's office and, you know, we're trying to end the blockade on Yemen. Here's another example. Um, you know, FCNL, we led this 70 plus org letter to try to, you know, to work on that. We got some media coverage there. But that org letter then drove other members to take action. And then uh, New York Times and CNN have been covering what the members are doing as well. And because, you know, FCNL was driving some of that, the reporters reach out to us. And I just got quoted in CNN yesterday, actually, uh, just because uh, of that connection. And, and I, I really think that's kind of the intersection of like having advocacy, driving a media narrative. And, and this is print media. There's a whole bunch of other types, you know, trying to get interviews. Um, on podcasts and, you know, things like that, continuing to tell your story. I completely agree with what was said earlier about social media being a really critical component of this. Component of this. 
But I think as the activist, it's really important that you do your research and know who are the reporters covering these different stories and try to build a relationship. Uh, one last thing as I'll share is uh, I saw that CNN, they covered uh, the Saudi blockade on Yemen. There was this really incredible blockbuster story by, the, by this reporter, Nema. And I don't know her, but she uh, she followed Shireen Alademi, who has come to speak at Kappa several times. And so I asked Shireen to reach out to Nema, and then we organized a, a half, an hour and a half Zoom call. We just were shooting the breeze. And now, like, we text back and forth about what's going on the Hill, and I try to try to let her know what's going on and and so behind the scenes we're helping drive some of the media narrative that cnn is covering on the blockade they don't really cover a lot of peace issues that well but on this blockade issue they're actually doing a, a, a really good job so hopefully some of these uh can some of these stories can can help you all drive your own activism and media outreach yeah that was interesting hassan and, and I, so I, th I saw you really hitting on two things uh, know who to pitch, know who you, who is yeah. vulnerable to your charms. And, you know, and, and I've had a lot of uh, experience recently with the um, environmental justice movement in Chicago, and there's not a lot of people covering environmental justice stuff in Chicago, in spite of the fact that it's a really big story. Um, I think, um, you know, there are only a few people who are doing it. So th those people have to really establish good relationships and know, know what's going on and, um, and know your pay. And know your peg is um, really important. The media is really susceptible to pegs and they can be, you know, what is different? What is different? They always want to know what changed here. You know, it's just not enough that people are starving in Yemen. It's got to be, there's a letter, there's a bill, there's a something, right. there's, and it can be inane. I mean, the media is susceptible to inane stuff like anniversaries and, um, you know, just ridiculous things that you never think are going to get picked up do get picked up, but, but it's got to be something different that they can lead with, that they can bite with in almost nothing. Um, it's shameful, but it's true. And that's, uh, that's kind of their, the, the, the criteria, I, I think, sometimes. Um, here we go. Uh, question number two is, how would you recommend uh, activists invest in relationships with media? And I was talking about the environmental justice thing there, where people get people get close, and it's important to have a relationship with people, uh, you know, in the media. And like the, some of the people who are coming up in this panel, you know, I've known Kathy Kelly for 30 years. I've known Vincent Emanuele, I don't know, 10, 15 years. Um, and you know, part of the things that make them um, important to me uh, was was kind of just understanding them as people and uh, you know Margaret talked about her being a physician and if you're building a relationship with somebody you can kind of build credibility I think by having a different dimension to your personality than I'm just the guy who's against the war in Yemen but I also cook great paella on the weekends uh, you know just like I am you know, I know Vincent is a guy who reads philosophy very deeply, and I can get a lot, I know all these things about uh, their personalities that make them real people, and then you have a, a relationship. You got to kind of break through to have a people relationship with media people, and that will just help help you do that, I think. That's one thing I think, uh, but Chris, you go ahead. Well, you're absolutely right, and I will add that takes an investment of time. Um, and so what makes coalition work so important, I think, on some of these, you know, global peace issues, for example, um, Palestine, Yemen, um, you know, uh, the entire U.S. imperial endeavor in continental Africa, or for that matter, Central or South America, um, and is, is that kind of network of communicators that can really stay in touch. That's how the CTU does it with the AFT. It's not what, like we're in constant you know, conversation. These are two big outfits, um, a local and a national union. And, and we you know, coordinate you know, some communication strategy, but the communications directors can also pick up the phone you know, and ask you know, who's in play in your market that I ought to talk to right now in terms of this pitch. 
So it's a real potential investment of time and energy. What I've done in my more movement work is we simply develop contact lists or hit lists of reporters that we know are willing to listen with an open ear if we respect their time. And that means, as you said, a really strong peg um, and a commitment to building that conversation over time. Um, and that's just, call it primitive, but that's how the corporate news business works right now. And there are sideways ways into that. You know, you get a really great story in, um, in these times or the intercept, and that pricks up the ears of corporate news directors sometimes. Um, and it is as important, I think, sometimes to maintain a conversation with those news directors, with the assignment editors, because those are the people who are making a lot of the decisions about who's going to cover a particular story or action on any given day. We have less and less beat reporters because reporters everywhere are frankly under assault. The the, that work category itself, their jobs as fellow workers, it's a really tough industry to work in right now. So we help their assignment editors. We help those beat reporters that are launched with no background at all, you know, general assignment reporters, rather, they're launched with no background at all into a story, and we can help shape it. And it's consistency. On Palestine, for example, over years that you're finally hearing a word like the Nakba you know, used on MSNBC. It's, it's kind of mind boggling. It's also, I think, an indication of the kind of tough, you know, propaganda war, peace activists battle from the opposition. Um, and it's doable, but you've got to make a really sustained effort. And that often for those of us who are volunteers in these endeavors means really sharing the load and um, sharing the wealth and networking well. All right, a couple of good, good important points there. And, and you uh, mentioned don't waste people's time. Uh, this is a big deal for reporters and things and meet their deadlines and promptness and all that is like Critical. hugely important um, to reporters. Um, uh, can't overestim uh, overestimate that. Um, Hassan, uh, same thing, building relationships. Yeah, I'm talking about, I, I feel bad that I said, oh, build a relationship, tell them about your paella, but they don't want you to waste your time either. <laughs> no one's going to write a story about my paella, I tell you that. Um, so, you know, I think being a really reliable source, knowing your details, I so oftentimes I, I have reporters calling me almost every single day at this point. And they reach out to me, okay, what's going on in Yemen? What's going on on the Hill? How does this member feel about this thing? What is Chairman Meeks gonna say about this? This joint resolution of disapproval, I don't really understand how uh, the that particular vehicle works. And I say, well, okay, well, it's, you know, you've got 15 days from uh, the State Department notification. And I go into the guts of how the Arms Export Control Act works. And if you can really, you know, so you start to be a resource for them and not even just to get quoted or get your story out there, um, you're basically helping them think about this issue. And you can do that without, you know, uh, I think, it, yeah, I just think it's really critical that you keep reaching out. Uh, Alex Ward at Vox, he's been doing a lot of stuff on Yemen. He goes to the State Department. I'm like, hey, you know, uh, we just heard this from the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. These are like three questions we really need to ask State Department. Here you go. No worries. You know, don't put too much pressure on these people. But, um, you know, just say, like, I think this is something really important. Another thing that this isn't really related to your question, but don't feel like you always have to be the direct voice. Sometimes I actually right. work through other people where I'll ghostwrite an op-ed for a faith leader in the community, and then and then they'll be the one that publishes it under their name, um, you know, and working through like, who's the best person to contact this person? Um, and that can be another really critical, really critical piece in getting your narrative out there. And at the end of the day, it doesn't really 
matter who the name is as long as the message and the narrative is is getting out there and that you're challenging the master narrative on and on the issues that we work with uh you know we're we're kind of a lot of these ideas are entrenched like unconditional support to israel is something that is just entrenched like we got to do that and if you don't you might be anti-Semitic. So like, uh, you know, there, there are all these narratives that we have to break open or Iran is a malign actor in the Middle East. Like, okay, well, we have to break apart that narrative to really understand, you know, explain the nuance of what happened in the 50s with Mosaddegh. And like, right. it's this constant education campaign. Um, and, you know, I, but I think it's doable. I've seen just last piece is I've seen over time driving that narrative on the Hill and with the media on Yemen, the conversations I have on the Hill right now about Yemen are completely different than the ones we had four years ago. And I think this uh, media strategy and so many, you know, Chicago area peace action has been working on this for so long and that and activists around the country. So it can work. It just takes a little time. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's an important thing where you said hand it off to other people. Because mm -hmm. then you look like a movement. You don't. You know, it's not just the same guy cranking out the stuff. And I, you know, as a media person, as an absorber, I want that. I want to. I want to pass the ball around. I don't want the same person cranking on the same thing all the time. And I want it to, you know, people to hear it from different people in the community. All sorts of things. That's. I think that's a really important thing. Um, here's. Uh, we'll s swing over to our last question. Um, and what do you think of, um, really it's about social justice work and covering social justice work and how it's changing right now and what impact it has in the public. Um, and do you, do you think there's a, a format that's more or less impactful? And, um, you know, I, I think the, the George Floyd thing was really interesting, and it's a pretty, and it's obviously going to be a seminal thing. Um, it, you know, I, I, I think, uh, you know, it's one of the things where you can point to, well, all this education and all this, uh, all this stuff did have an impact. Uh, it, it, all this social, um, uh, all the, the, the social movement had an impact. Uh, it, it's, it's, and now people are accepting you know, social justice arguments in a way they weren't before. Um, and it's a moment where their media is absorbing those in a way it's, it hasn't before. Um, uh, Chris, do you want to pop in on this? Well, I, I'd also point to um, the, um, the movement for uh, uh, equal marriage rights for LGBTQ people, um, because that was never going to happen until all of a sudden it completely flipped. Um, and that was the result of decades of persistent work, um, often in increasing coalition to really change public perceptions. And, you know, reporters are the public. Um, at the same time that that deep political work was also going on. Um, you know, in Palestine, uh, when it comes to that issue, um, it, it's it's important to note that the most what I consider to be one of the most potent and persistent disinformation campaigns on the planet. You know, the you know intersecting Hasbara that comes out right now. The, my union is being targeted with that because um, there's a rank and file effort to um, uh, ask um, our elected delegates to consider a resolution on Palestine. Um, San Francisco's teachers union just passed a resolution um, in open support of BDS. That, that would have been unthinkable, unthinkable even a year ago, but it is what it is until it switches. And the coalition work when you are marshalling that and the grassroots voices that you can lift up from that kind of coalition work to put many faces, you know, with that consistent message behind the effort is really, really powerful. Um, we want to represent the movements that we're building. Um, and that means that it's not always one spokesperson expert. Um, it really is those grassroots folks. But the other thing that we're responsible for as communicators is also making sure 
that, you know, a camera that's trolling a demonstration of 5,000 people is going to find 5,000 informed people there. So educating our own base um, as assertively as we work to educate the media is really, really important because it ensures that we are vastly spreading the capacity to always address opposition with the hard facts and the human faces that tell the story of the consequences of those hard facts and the things that have to be changed. And that all has to sync together as part of a broader um, public information effort that includes outreach to the corporate press. Um, Hassan, you wanna take a swing at that? Yeah, I mean, so I, yeah, I completely agree about you know, educating our base and not just educating, but training people how to right. speak on issues. And that's something that I don't really see a lot of uh, in the in the peace movement more broadly. And I'm dealing with peace activists in Oklahoma and Alaska, you know, you know, and I think just a general education campaign on how to speak on different issues and, you know, providing like clear talking points can be really helpful. Um, I just want to kind of share a story that I think can potentially plug in. So we had this issue with the, you know, I shouldn't say we had this, the Iran nuclear deal is something that I really care about restoring. And I know a lot of people in the, in the peace action movement have been working so hard on this for years. And we're in a situation uh, where we've got the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and some prominent members on SFRC. Uh, they don't support getting back into the Iran deal. They want a longer and stronger deal. And so we've got a lot of people that do want to get back into the Iran deal, but we've got these really prominent Democrats. And so what we, what we kind of did is behind the scenes, we sort of crafted this, you know, we identified the different members uh, that were going to be problematic. And we tried to build coalition support in each of those districts. And then, so, you know, that started with, uh, you know, coalition letters in Delaware, Maryland, and New Jersey. And so, you know, that coalition effort then turned into op-eds and LTE. So those people were, were, you know, fired up, they were doing it, but it took someone being like a spark plug, FCNL basically, you know, called grassroots organizations, you know, over the course of several weeks earlier in the year. And what we were trying to do is isolate their position. Now we were doing it at the grassroots level, but we we're also trying at the national level and understanding how those two pieces intersect. If we can get, you know, national folks working in DC, you know, obviously Peace Action has a great, you know, national uh, presence in DC, but you've got all these, these affiliates around the country and really figuring out a way to work together. So the grassroots is supporting some of the national advocacy that's happening. Um, and then driving that media narrative by getting prominent voices. We, we pitched an op-ed to uh, the head of the United Methodist Church to try to, to try to publish that, to basically call out Senator Cardin for, for not supporting the Iran deal. And I don't think that, you know, nothing's very like, you can't draw a straight line from, you know, one action to policy change. But shortly thereafter, we were able to, you know, appoint, um, uh, Robert Malley, the U.S. envoy to Iran, to, that's going to help you know spark this. And then we saw the outbreak of Vienna talks about restoring the Iran deal. And I think that grassroots push is really critical to give members cover. I, I think that's kind of what we're trying to do is is give political cover to the Biden administration as they're trying to to get. Uh, get back in the deal because they're facing intense opposition from uh, uh, the right. Obviously, we we knew that was going to happen, but also key Democrats in the party. Uh, I I hope this was helpful. I you know I just like to give concrete examples of what I what I see working and you know the nexus between you know the national orgs and how the grassroots can play a critical role in this is super important and knowing who your member is you're in chicago you you have the number two democrat in the senate he's the whip he's the guy he is the guy senator durbin uh you know getting you know getting him on the line you know really 
trying to uh, influence him changes the whole narrative uh, across across the country and with Democrats everywhere. So I hope that's helpful. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I think we should all give an example. And Chris, I'll ask you in a second for an example of some kind of campaign that you think is effective or um, is not effective or is illustrative of, of just kind of the, the whole span of things. And I, I you know, I, I did environmental reporting at the station for a year. And, I, you know, I got to see this environmental justice thing, as I alluded to before, and I found it so strange, the coverage of it. And the people in the environmental justice movement are grassroots community people. They're all doing great work. They're um, people of, of color. They're, they're doing amazing things, just monitoring their own health that you would... That, that seem to be, um, you know, they so go, go so far and above beyond what any normal person has to do to, to ensure their a quality of life. And, um, so, and they're organizing and they have ideas about what they want to see in their community that are great. And um, yet they, they, hard, they have a hard time getting a good hearing in the media. You know, there's a few people who cover environmental justice things. And, um, there's, and they come off as kind of like the people who don't want the business and the jobs. And it's always equated to here's the business and the jobs, and here's these angry people who um, you know want something else. And that's such a ugly kind of portrayal of the whole thing. And um, and look at the the frustration and the, the the way that those cases go. You know, they're challenging things in court. It's so incremental. It's you know, if you aren't following it all the time, it's it's just like a wall of um, uh, trouble or something. And and that, that, that editors look at it that way and they don't know what to make of it. Even, you know, they, they are so, it's completely subjective. I was working with people who wanted to do it all the time. I was working with people who like, I don't, I don't care that the federal government just called Lori Lightfoot racist. Um, I, I don't, you know, that doesn't, is that really something? I don't know. Um, I, I, it was so strange. And then to see these people eventually go hunger strike. I mean, that's like the, 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 that's like the last resort. That's the last resort of anybody globally is to go hunger strike. They want hunger strike to get attention and to really, um, you know, they're trying to seal the deal on stopping this one plant um, and and their frustrations about, you know, fighting the past, the future, and um, and the present pollution are just unbelievable. Uh, it's, it, it, and it never really fully comes out in the, you know, it, it, I'm, I was so disappointed by the whole interaction that these great people are here. They've got to go hunger strike to really get get their 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 message across. I don't know. I just thought I'd share that, and I, I don't for what it's worth. And uh, Chris, you you go for an example. Well, I I think that's a absolutely right. And, and you know, our job is to make it as simple as possible, given the limitations of what we know we're contending with in newsrooms, to kind of punch through that. Um, and. You know, the old adage, if it bleeds, it leads, is still very much true. So you want to talk about hunger strikes. I mean, people had to strike for a month at diet to save that school. This was before I actually joined the CTU. Um, but I remember marching with the union um, in these massive community marches, um, be, you know, to try to keep 50 schools open. And what I say by citing these examples is when it comes to, for example, the broad education justice movement, that's a very intersectional movement. That's a space right now where teachers are taking positions on spending money on, you know, imperial U.S. wars abroad versus public education needs at home. And that's the result of years, I think, amongst movement workers themselves of this growing awareness that we have to come proper on everything. And we have to ground our work in community and meet, meet people where they're at so that the face of the effort to save diet truly was the community people who were most directly invested in that, not the teachers union that represented the workers that were gonna lose their jobs. Um, but, you know, I remember, you know, in organizing against the second Gulf War, there were people who said, we can't talk about Israel-Palestine because it's not related. The fuck it's not. Um, and, and changing that mindset within the movement 
of no, we've got to compartmentalize. We've got to evolve, uh, um, you know, avoid those third rails. And, it, and those third rails are always incremental because there's always something right behind it that you also shouldn't touch too much because it's too controversial. Our job is to change hearts and minds. Huey Garcia was at last week's massive protest for, you know, Palestinian self-determination. Marie Newman, who ran, you know, on a principled position on that conflict, against, you know, Lipinski, one of the most reactionary Democratic um, congressmen in Congress, um, and then waffled after she was elected. And yesterday she spoke at that massive demonstration downtown for Palestinian self-determination. That's the result of the kind of community pressure that moves a public face that the press show up to. And for better or worse, we have to recognize that People in our newsrooms see hierarchy and carry bias, despite renewed efforts or perhaps first time efforts not to exercise that. And we've got to punch through that with those both compelling grassroots voices and prominent public voices that diversify um, the perspective of who it is that is standing up with the you know, a countervailing opinion that must be considered um, as we raise these core issues of justice. I, I don't know if that is helpful or not, but. I thought it was awesome, Chris. <laughs> now, here's how. <laughs> the... I'm so undercaffeinated. I apologize. <laughs> you don't seem it. I'll tell you that. You seem fine. The, um, uh, the questions, a couple questions from the chat thing. Um, here's one on, is Twitter the best way to approach some of these mainstream media reporters? How do you do it? Um, man, reporters are on Twitter. Boy, do they live in the Twitterverse. Um, you know, DM is a, is a good tactic. Um, and a lot of reporters are looking for stories. So I think when you're talking about, you know, these broad, you know, these, you know, arenas of global conflict, you know, know who lives out there in the Twitterverse that is reporting this issue that isn't necessarily in your city or town, um, but that has an interest and might be interested in something that a local group is doing that intersects with this, you know, larger campaign for justice. Um, that's how, you know, we get, you know, build this sense of momentum in these story arcs with some of these reporters of, you know, people in six different, you know, somewhat un incongruous places sometimes that have all taken a stand because they're concerned about children starving to death in Yemen um, and their tax dollars bankrolling that. Um, so I just, you know, DM or engage, sometimes engage, because they pay attention to who also shares out their stuff. Um, these folks are in the unfortunate situation of essentially having to build brand as individuals simultaneously that they're reporting for news organizations that may or may not exist next year. So, you know, and increasingly we're seeing whole cadres of reporters moving out. Uh, Block Club Chicago is a great example of this. One of the like most, you know, vibrant local news organizations out there that is covering HILCO, um, that is covering environmental justice issues, that is covering, you know, both these more global and these deep in the neighborhood, kind of in the weeds, you know, justice struggles, um, exploit those. And every single time you get a good hit, think about the reporters that you're targeting out there in the Twitterverse, but haven't found a way to get to and make sure you're sharing that out. You know, you, you build this by keeping them in the loop and empowering them with information that they didn't have that may be useful to them um, and strike up a conversation. You'd be amazed at how receptive some of these reporters are to that. And, you know, you make a kind of a good point about the um, hierarchy of things. Uh, you, you know, you work with the smallest local reporter you can, get a story in and then build up you know, build your way up. You don't start at the, you know, with the editorial board of the Tribune. Right. As, start with Block Club. I'm, Block Club's driving so many stories. It's, it's incredible. They really are. It's they're incredible. Own, they're owning the universe. Um, uh, Hassan, you want to pop in on this? And then we'll wrap up. Yeah, sure. I Yeah, I mean, you know, 
you got to reach out to reporters and, and pitch them. And, you know, sometimes they'll, I mean, they make it pretty easy. Just look at their Twitter handle. Normally they're like, you know, feel free to send me a text message or, you know, drop a line in their your DMs. And, uh, but when you do talk, make sure that you're really informed on the subject that you're talking about. You know who the reporter is that you're talking about, you know, like, read all the things that you know like uh, you know go to their history uh, of whatever news organization they're you know they're working for and read the different articles understand their perspective sometimes there are you can get press from people that you really don't want to because they're going to take a spin uh that's you know maybe like pro empire <laughs> or you know pro the war in yemen and you got to be really careful i think and you know trying to figure out you know how to get your story out there to the right messenger and you know but yeah reach out try to get try to build some relationships I, I think there's a real problem right now let me just address a problem i see is that there's not a lot of places for i remember when i was working for kappa we had a really hard time trying to find people to cover what we were doing and you know i i had this contact at the chicago tribune like it was really difficult we got something at one point but you know there's a real need and i think i think kappa itself could be a hub for for the stories that you want to see out there and you know publishing things uh, things on your own site getting good blogs out there you know making sure that people are reading them um you know pushing them like hey we just published this share it with the, the member of congress uh, that you know that you're trying to influence and then you know build some attention around that even in lieu of getting a, a you know a story because you know back to what I said at the beginning you know make your own news I, I think that's super important tell your own story if you can you know create your own podcasts uh, you know if you can you know have your own you know webinars teach-ins social media and really drive that narrative and you know, and then keep inviting members of Congress, their staff, other reporters, and then build that buzz and hopefully it can, uh, you know, come together for, for more attention on your issue. And uh, anyway, I just appreciate this conversation. It, it's really uh, it got me thinking. I, I learned a few things over here from both of you, Jerome and Chris. So thanks. Yeah, thank you, Chris Ann, and uh, thank you, Chris. And hey, we ended on time. This is awesome. We did it. I thought we were going to blow right through there for a second.